You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 2, Sonnet 1. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and more importantly for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. For those of you who've recently joined me on this adventure, this is a re-recording of the original Sonnet 1 episode into audio podcast format. It's easier on the eyes, easier on the ear, and is considerably more complete. Please keep your suggestions and criticism coming. It's important to note that in addition to the background required to read the sonnets in a way that makes sense, which is available in the first episode of this podcast, it must be understood that the sonnets simply do not work out of context. Each sonnet builds on its predecessors, and there are aspects of the early sonnets that only become apparent when later sonnets refer back to them. There may be some statements that I make about Sonnet 1, for example, that will seem like a real stretch, but I'll always try to provide evidence where practical. The good news is that the sonnets are easily available online at shakespeares-sonnets.com, including the original 1609 quarto editions, which are very helpful. And with just the background provided from the previous podcast, you'll be more than ready to read the sonnets without me and still have a pretty good idea of what's going on. A note before we begin. It is helpful to begin our journey into the sonnets with a quote from Sonnet 24. Now see what good turns eyes for eyes have done. Mine eyes have drawn thy shape, and thine for me. Are windows to my breast, where through the sun delights to peep, to gaze therein on thee. What Shakespeare is saying is that the eyes are the windows to the soul, and in Arthur Golding's version of Narcissus and Echo, Narcissus' bright, twinkling eyes, often called stars, are very important. Even though the sonnets were originally numbered with Arabic numerals, I like the fact that it's become traditional to print them using Roman numerals. So the I, 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 and I, I, I that label sonnets 1, 2, and 3 are effectively titling each sonnet in a way suggesting that it is both an I, E-Y-E, or window into Shakespeare's soul, and also an I as in identity or a representation of Shakespeare himself. It's also important to note here that when he writes where through the sun delights to peep. He is also referencing his son Hamnet, whose love he harbors within his breast. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 1. From fairest creatures we desire increase, that thereby beauty's rose might never die. Beauty, throughout the sonnet sequence, refers to Shakespeare and his creative store of wonderful ideas and words. Beauty's rose is both the sonnet that is planted on the page and the sonnet sequence in its entirety. The well-understood reference that's being made in these two lines is to husbandry, which means farming, where we breed the best stock of our animals and crops. But the word we need to look more closely at is creatures. The word is also used in the sense of things that are created, in particular referring to the best ideas, words, and works that Shakespeare has to draw on. The we that desires increase is both the general we, but also the sonnets of the sonnet sequence. And so the sonnets desire to be increased by the fairest creations of Shakespeare's mind in order to preserve themselves. But as the riper should by time decease, his tender air might bear his memory. The riper means the older, or more mature, which would be both the physical Shakespeare and the earlier sonnets in the sequence. Shakespeare will physically die in time, but his sonnets will experience a different kind of death as the reader moves on to the later sonnets and forgets the earlier ones. The tender air, the sonnet version of Shakespeare, will carry his memory forward even when his physical body is gone. Tender here means soft and gentle and younger, but from the middle of the 16th century, the word also meant to formally offer a plea, evidence or money to discharge a debt. This last meaning fits well with the language of spending and lending in Sonnet 4. With this in mind, the sonnets are Shakespeare's heirs that he is lending to the reader and using to pay off his debt to Hamnet, his lost son. But thou contracted to thine own bright eyes, feedest thy light's flame with self-substantial fuel. Contracted here has three different meanings. 
The first and most straightforward is legally obliged, in particular being bound by the written word. The second meaning in Shakespeare's day was married, which refers to the relationship of Narcissus to his reflection. And the third meaning is to be made smaller. In the sequence, we experience Shakespeare shrinking himself, shrinking his spirit into these 154 sonnets or little songs, summarizing himself, or 154 aspects of himself, into 154 eyes, 154 windows into his soul. Thy light's flame is a reference to Cupid's fire from the Narcissus tale, which is the burning love that Narcissus has for his reflection, and that love is what Shakespeare has for himself, for his son, for his work, the sonnets, and even for the reader, without whom his efforts here would be in vain. We see this in the famous sonnet 130, My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun, where he is saying that although the reader isn't physically attractive, his love for her is truer than that which any other man has lied to her about. What Shakespeare is doing here is burning his own love in order to fuel more love. He is investing himself in this literal labor of love in which the more love he gives, the more he will get in return. Whether he began writing these sonnets in 1593 when Marlowe died, or 1596 when Hamnet died, the sonnet sequence became his life's work, and he poured everything he had into it, especially because after Hamnet died, he had no one else to share his legacy with. On the other side of the sonnet looking glass, the sonnets are doing the feeding. If we think of Narcissus' reflection being self-substantial or made of Narcissus, the reflection was feeding Narcissus' burning desire. Simultaneously, the sonnets must beget or inspire other sonnets, if Shakespeare or the sonnets are to exist for posterity. Making a famine where abundance lies, thyself thy foe, to thy sweet self too cruel. All of these words and thoughts are Shakespeare's lifeblood, and in the graphic novel I use the image of him pricking himself and bleeding into the open mouth of his waiting sonnet reflection. Metaphorically speaking, Shakespeare's blood flowed black with the ink of unwritten words, words that needed to be written or would be buried with his physical body when he died. Shakespeare is feeding the sonnets his lifeblood, and they will leave a creative void when they are done. The sonnets are to Shakespeare as the water's reflection is to Narcissus, a cruel enemy that takes but does not give, an untouchable lover. This image holds even as we switch to the other side of the mirror. The sonnets are taking the love from Shakespeare that was due the world, love that rightly belonged to his son and his family and the audiences of his plays, but the sonnets cannot touch the poet. Another reading of the last line is that by turning his tragedy into the sonnets, Shakespeare is being cruel to himself by indulging and wallowing in his grief far longer and far more profoundly than might be considered natural. Thou that art now the world's fresh ornament. The fresh ornament is the sonnet. As it is being written, it is full of youth. Art is a very interesting word, because in addition to its use as the older form of the word are, it can also be read as the verb to create, meaning you, Shakespeare, who are now creating the world's fresh ornament. And only herald to the gaudy spring. Herald was not only one who announces or a messenger, but it was also the title given to the 13 members of the College of Arms who could authorize a coat of arms for the Shakespeare family. The Shakespeare's coat of arms was authorized merely three months after Hamnet's death. It is not recorded whether the death influenced the decision, but either way it rendered the coat of arms practically useless to the family name in the long run. The gaudy spring has two important meanings. The first is that in Golding's language it is the word used to refer to the water in the heavenly clearing in which Narcissus sees his reflection. The second is the seasonal reference that is used throughout the sequence wherein spring is youth, Summer, maturity, and the prime of life, and winter is old age and death. Within thine own bud buriest thy content, and, tender churl, mixed waste in niggarding. The rose is Shakespeare's symbol of both sonnet and sonnet sequence. There are two meanings of the word content that are important in these two lines. The first is the contents of Shakespeare. He is burying his soul, his inner self, into the bud, that is rosebud, that he is planting on this page. The second is that he is burying his happiness, because he is mourning his son and the loss of his legacy. At the same time, the sonnet's content is buried within the page, possibly beneath its words in the way that a human spirit is buried beneath their appearance. Niggarding in Shakespeare's day meant to be miserly or stingy, and here is saying that to keep Shakespeare's inspiration, 
his son's memory and his creative legacy to himself would be wasteful and foolish. At the same time, there's a suggestion that writing these sonnets rather than attempting to have another son is selfish and wasteful and foolish. Pity the world, or else this glutton be, to eat the world's dew by the grave and thee. These two lines are especially ambiguous. For Shakespeare, pitying the world can be both sharing his reflections with his living friends, family and audiences, but also creating the sonnets. Either way he will be a glutton if he keeps his reflections for himself, whether he records them in the sequence or not at all. For the sonnet, pitying the world means inspiring another sonnet and not keeping Shakespeare's words to itself. The sonnet is a glutton both for keeping Shakespeare's words from the living world, but also for not sharing them with the rest of the sonnets. One coherent reading of these last two lines is this. Pity the world, Shakespeare, or be this sonnet. This sonnet will consume whatever you have to offer. A final possible reading is that the reader is being asked to pity the world by giving voice to the sonnets. Grave is a very interesting word choice. It has two additional meanings that we don't often consider, from the Old French serious and the Old English to dig, which foreshadows the trenches in Sonnet 2. Graves and tombs are referenced quite a lot throughout the sonnet sequence. The sequence is Shakespeare's legacy's grave, in which the bard buries his reflections, and the sequence is always mourning by the graves of both Shakespeare and Hamlet. The story of the sonnet sequence takes place beside the grave, just as Narcissus died next to the water. Here we read of a Shakespeare beside his son's grave, the sonnets beside the creator's grave, and the reader looking into the grave in which the creator's spirit was buried. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they have not enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording these podcasts, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. And please join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnet comics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another not one in your place? place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? surrender.